able to give him a hand. Why don't we welcome our senior leader, Pastor Matt, sharing on faith, identity and authority. Praise God. How are we doing? We good? Uh, isn't our fit team doing just an amazing job? Seriously, thanks, Tim. Incredible. Uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I need that one. Yeah, it, like uh, our fit team's so good. And as, as Sandra gets off, thanks, Sandra, for playing and, and uh, doing everything there. Um, keyboards don't play themselves as good as they are at the moment. They require somebody to press down that... Uh, those black and white things up the top, which is good. So um, uh, I'm just going to get you to stand up on your feet for a moment and uh, uh, put your hand on the shoulder of the person beside you. And, uh, and I want you to pray the, this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I open my heart to receive from your word. And Lord, I speak a blessing, your blessing over the person beside me, let your kingdom come, let your will be done in my life and in theirs today in Jesus' name. Amen. High five somebody and take a seat. Beautiful. Well, are you ready? This is going to be a big, big message in a very, very short time. Are you ready? So I'm, yeah, I believe I can. Uh, I believe I can. So <clears throat> today, uh, the key scripture that we're going to be looking at is Matthew chapter 19. And if you've got your Bible, so I just encourage you to open to that. Uh, Matthew chapter 19 is a wonderful chapter. It starts off with Jesus spending a bit of time with the kids and uh, blessing them. And uh, from there, uh, he goes into, he talks about marriage and divorce, he talks about celibacy, and then he talks to the kids, you know, how many know that that's a great, uh, great couple of subjects before preaching to the kids and spending time with them? Uh, and then it goes on to uh, uh, this, uh, the focus of today, which is going to be when Jesus counsels a rich young ruler, and then it goes into him saying, don't worry, everything is possible with God, which uh, how many believe that? Yeah. And then he goes into <clears throat> a, a, an incredible turn and an incredible twist where uh, he starts to talk about positions of authority. And so today I'm going to, uh, I'm going to hopefully hit pretty hard and then it's all going to turn out good. Is that all right? Okay, fantastic. So, the story of the rich young ruler, many of you will know this well. We will read it, but many of you will know this well. It's actually the absolute best example of how Jesus talks to a person about their faith, about their identity, and then he talks to his disciples uh, about authority. And, um, <clears throat> and this is, of course, the theme that we are in currently at the moment. As many of you will no doubt realise, I am a man. And, uh, and <clears throat> I know, <clears throat> I can behave like a little girl sometimes and cry at Hallmark ads and, and uh, those uh, romantic comedies and, and all of that. But generally speaking, no, specifically speaking, I'm very much a man. Now, as a man, as many of you men and women will be able to relate... I can often fall into the trap of my identity being completely wrapped up in what I do. How many know that that's not true? I am not what I do. Awesome. I'm getting some nods of affirmation. That's good. So who I am as a husband, who I am as a father, how good I am a husband. And I can talk quite openly because Anna's not here. I can get away with a few things, so it should be all right. Um, but uh, who I am as a husband, uh, maybe some failings as a husband, who I am as a father, who I am, uh, you know, uh, who I am uh, uh, is uh, I am a husband, I am a father, uh, I, I am a pastor, um, but it's not actually who I am. I am still talking about that fact that that's what I do. Yeah. I might be good at it. I may not be good at it. You may have an opinion of whether I'm good or not at it. 
but the truth is this, that's not who I am, all right? So, at the same time, the dilemma here that we're facing is the simple truth that, that who I am is still evident in my life. L- like, who I am determines what I do, and what I d- do displays kind of who I am. So if I turned up to church and I was dressed in a three-piece suit, little flower, uh, you know, and I was like gold rings, uh, gold watch, you know, whenever I smile, there's a little dimenti on the tooth, you know, it was just like a schmick. I started talking about the need for jets and, you know, started all that sort of thing and, and I get up here and I do that and yet Anna and the kids turn up in rags what sort of message am I preaching? A very, very wrong one, right? And so, uh, uh, who I am is still evident in the fact that, you know, whilst Josh is barefoot at the moment, he doesn't walk around everywhere barefoot, (laughs) right? Uh, Who I am is the truth that, uh, you know, um, he hasn't got nits in his hair because, well, we wash his hair fairly regularly and make sure that he's kind of healthy most of the time, right? So, who I am as a father, who I am as a husband is displayed externally around my life, right? But at the same time, the dilemma is that's not necessarily who I am because I've met many a man who may pay good dollars towards their family, but he himself is a rotten pig. Hello? Not many a man, very few, but it's still the case. Hello? I've met many a bloke down the street and they're a nice enough bloke right? But his wife is hurting inside, or his children are lost, or those sorts of things. Hello? So, the dilemma is, is who I am is kind of displayed externally around my life, but the external display around my life is not still a mirror reflection of really who I am. Okay, you with me? All right, this is the foundation as, as, uh, that we're building today. So, some of you may or may not know, Anna and I bought a business several years ago, and it has not gone well. We've closed that business, and in essence, it would be a, f- a, a, a success of fail. <laughs> we successfully failed. <laughs> Yeah, you're laughing. <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm still hurting over it, but that's all right. But, but, that, that, but how many know that a failure, failure of a business is not who I am? Amen. Hello? Right. And the same with you. You may have lots of failures in your life, but let me assure you today that is not who you are. Hello? Great. You may be suffering illness today, and you might think that that is most definitely, look, that's just part of who I am, it's as as a result of this, it's a result of that actions. Let me tell you, your health is not determined by who you are. There is only one person that determines who you are, and we're going to talk about him in just a few moments. How many know that I have had a failed marriage? No, I know, that comes as a great shock to you, doesn't it? All right? I fail as a husband all the time, but my marriage with Anna is great. I've actually had a failed marriage, and it was devastating to me. My first failed marriage was when I married two people, and they ended up divorcing 12 months later. It hurt me a lot. What have I done? How have I failed them? Did I not prepare them for marriage enough? Some of you are completely confused by what I've just said. I married two people. What is this church all about? He talks about money. He talks about many, multiple wives. And no, let me assure you, there was two people that asked me as their pastor to marry them. Ah, the penny drops. Fantastic. Ah, I love it. So at that point, I, I was devastated by that because when I, when I see and help two people get married, 
when I see that take place, I come into that place of men. This is a this is a holy moment. This is a moment of great responsibility to see them come together well, be prepared well, so that they are married for ever, right? That they love and respect each other, that they honor one another, each other above the other. Amen. Hello? Yeah. Right. And so that, but but that doesn't now. I don't look look at them and say, well, because they because that didn't wasn't successful, then that must mean I can't marry any, anyone, or I'm I'm no good as a pastor to lead people in marriage. Hello, that doesn't determine who I am, does it? Right. How do you struggle with all of this? How do you deal with as you look back at? you know, failures or, you know, there could be areas of sin in your life that you just carry that shame. I've got good news for you today. God's, God, Jesus is not worried about your sin. There's only one person that worries about your sin and his name's Lucifer and he's a rotten pig. He wants nothing more than to see your destruction by reminding you of that sin. And it could have been five minutes ago. Friends, Jesus, we just celebrated it. Jesus has done and dealt with your sin. All that's required of us is for us to come to him and say, oh, Jesus, I'm so sorry. I repent of it and I'm going to do my absolute utmost not to continue to live like that. That's it. And it's done. He's already done it. He's already dealt with it. That's good news. Amen. Amen. Like when we come into worship, you should be, woohoo! you know, like that's been dealt with. Death, death is done. There's no sting in death anymore. Right. Hello? Right. So if I was, you, you know, you may have heard the, uh, the, the saying, show me your friends and I'll show you who you are, right? You, you know, <laughs> the whole marriage thing is like, I'm not saying anything anymore. <laughs> you know, you know, I'm not opening my mouth at all. <laughs> but, you know, show me. But equally, I could probably say, show me how you live your life and I'll show you who you are. Like, let's, let's, if we had a reality TV show and we called it the real life of Tim Lord, like, can you imagine? Can, can you imagine what that would be like? And millions of viewers all around the world would lock in and it would be called Love Island, Tim Lord, or something like that. You know what I'm saying? I'm not asking for a show of hands who watches that show. But anyway, if we had a reality TV show, we'd probably, and the camera followed Tim everywhere, um, you could probably start to get a bit of an idea of who Tim is. But is it really who Tim is? Not really, no, you don't know what to answer. <laughs> well, maybe, you know. But some of who Tim is would be displayed in that reality TV show. You could there and goggle box it and, and why did he make that decision? You could carry an opinion as to what you think and who you think Tim is. But really, when it all boils down to it, when Tim is on that last breath, he's about to graduate into heaven, you may only have a certain perspective of who Tim really is actually is. Hello? So, if that's a dilemma of how we live our life and how a person's external world reflects some of what is happening internally, your decisions, the way you speak, whether it is uh, successes or failures, how you handle those seasons reflect some of who you are. That's a dilemma. That's the dilemma, isn't it? It's called life. Who loves life sometimes? It's like it throws you curveballs and all sorts of uh, interesting things all the time. Your life, actually, how you address those successes and failures, your life actually reflects your faith factor. So how you approach those seasons, I could go through that, that uh, you know, as I go through the feelings and the emotions and, and as a man, as a husband, looking back at, at, uh, at, at you know, the business that wasn't successful, like, I, I could look back and I could go, God, why did you let that happen? How many have said that to God sometimes? What, God, why? How could you let that happen? Um, my uh, my sister-in-law's father has, in the last only few days, has just discovered an inoperable, highly aggressive brain tumour. 
and uh, I'm not sure of life expectancy, but I can imagine that, that you know, I, I, even I can feel that, and I don't know Ian terribly well, but, but I can go, God, here is a man who has served you faithfully. How could you let this happen? And you see, when we struggle and when we face those seasons of extreme, uh, some are extreme, some are small, but as we face those seasons, it actually helps us reflect on our faith factor, that seed of faith within our life that says, this is whom I put my faith in. Regardless of how I feel, regardless of what people's opinion of me is, this is, this is who I am. Who I am is who I put my fa- faith in. And that is Father, amen? So don't be confused about uh, uh, if your mood displays who you are. How many know that one minute you could be happy, one minute you could be sad, amen? Amen. Like you could watch a really funny ad and then the next minute it's a sad ad and your emotion has changed altogether. Yeah. Hello? You could be super happy and then you walk along, you stub your toe and suddenly you're not happy. <laughs> right? I did that. Josh has just uh, uh, acquired a new bed and there's that little corner at the end of the leg and every time hits three of my little toes and I go, mm, mother of goodness, Lord, you are just so... Praise you, Lord, you're so good. And we do a bit of a Pentecostal two-step dance. And then we move on with life, of course. But friends, moods don't determine who you are. Hello? Moods aren't necessarily who you are at all. Only God determines who you are. Because if I allow my default to take over of who I am, it's not going to be good. (laughs) Not going to be good at all. Uh, Who I am is going to be reflected in the moods of whether I swear and carry on after a stubbed toe or after a failed business, right? Hello? See, there's this difference here of where the Bible says, gird up your loins. It's an old, it's an old saying, and, and that means gird and pick yourself up, gird up your loins, stand strong, stand with who you are, and stand with whose you are, as Pastor Rose shared last week. Amen? So, here is Matthew chapter 19. This is what God says, and this is how God led this young gentleman through I'm going to read. Uh, yeah, I'm going to read out of the New King James <coughs> version. We're going to move as quickly as I can through this. Now, behold, one came. This is, uh, this is verse 16. One came and uh, said to him, being Jesus, "Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life?" So he, being Jesus, said to him, "Who do? You, who, why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. But if you want to enter into life," keep the commandments. And he said, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honour your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbour as yourself. The young men said to him, all these things I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when the young man heard what th- that, he, uh, that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Verse 23, when Jesus said to his disciples, assuredly I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Verse 25. Well, the when, it sounds like I'm calling a race or something, isn't it? <laughs> When the disciples heard it, they went around the astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? Around and around the court. But Jesus looked at them and said to them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Can I get an amen? amen. Then Peter answered and said to him, See, uh, we have left... See, I love Peter. Anyway, I'm going to come to him. But he says, See, I, we have all fo- left everything to follow you, therefore what shall we have? So Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits upon the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive one hundredfold... Can I get an Amen. 
and an inherent and inherit eternal life but many who are first will be last and the last shall be first all right praise god we're going to land this quickly you ready we know that this rich young man, it's actually, it's actually uh, as you study the scripture and as you look into it, that rich young man was actually a teenager. So that teenager, has, he'd actually inherited a lot. He was very devout. Um, he was a good steward with what he had. He was very diligent. He was a keeper of the law. He kept the sacred days. He tithed. He prayed. He honored his father and his mother. He knew what it was to be a good Christian young man. <clears throat> he did all that was right all the time and enjoyed knowing that he was living a good life. Back then, what, what the belief system was that if you had great wealth, then you were blessed by God. And if you were blessed by God with great wealth, then you were an absolute sure ticket into eternal life. Hello? Hello? Well, if that was true, what would mean to the beggar on the street? Well, you clearly haven't been best blessed by God. You can't eter enter eternal life. Hello? What an absolute polarised view of the Father's heart for us. <clears throat> he makes this statement to Jesus. He says, good teacher... Some texts actually translate that as he didn't say good teacher or rabbi. In, Matthew, in the book of Matthew, the original language actually says that he turns to Jesus and he says, wonderful. Wow. What in a way to address Jesus. Hello? Amen. My name's Matthew. Wonderful. Like... <laughs> Like, you'd feel pretty good if somebody just called, hey, wonderful, yeah. wouldn't you, right? <laughs> yes, somebody's calling my name, you know what I mean? You know, Anna doesn't call me wonderful very often at all, <laughs> all right? But um, anyway, she's not here, so I shouldn't say that. So, but he saw Jesus as a teacher. You see, where we place our faith, where we place our faith is, is how we see God, how we see Jesus, he, some texts say that they, he just saw him as a teacher. The book of Matthew actually shows that he saw Jesus as wonderful. But he still didn't see Jesus as saviour. And to many Christians live their life, to many of us who believe in God, don't see Jesus as saviour, we only see him as a good mate. Or a good man that died upon the cross. Well, friends, the Muslims believe that Jesus was a good man. There are many historical books that talk about Jesus as a very good person. But friends, do we put our faith in him? Do we lay down our life for him? He said, take up your cross. So in other words, live, but be ready and be continually laying down your life for him. Friends, when you said yes to Jesus, you said no to yourself. And in, 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 in that, he said, you can have it all now. Hello? Yeah. All right. So Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith, in other words, is how you see before it is seen. Your expectancy, it's your Prejudgment. Have you ever looked at somebody and judged them on how they appear or how they, how they smell? Or hello, you know Daniel's doing Movember at the moment and he's growing a bit of a, you know, a bit of a caterpillar thing over here. And uh, you know, keep working on that, mate. That's that's good. But you know, I might see him down the road and go, dude, like drop the mustache. You know, you <laughs> know. Bless you, mate. Um, but you see, but you might see me and go, dude, like, get, treat this up here. Like, this is, this is disappearing fast. Do something about, put a hat on or something. Like, turn the lights down, man. It's like reflecting. Anyway, the point is this. It is, faith is our prejudgment. It's the lens by which we see. 
The rich young ruler had a certain perspective as to how he saw Jesus. That's why he said, wonderful teacher. He said, tell me something, I'm asking for the key. The rich young ruler doesn't realize that he was talking to the key himself. Friends, he was looking for that morsel of goodness. And he says, um, <clears throat> tell, he said, but tell, you tell me something. Do you see Jesus in the way that he deserves to be seen? Do you see him? Do you approach him in the way that he deserves to be approached? Friends, we just don't pay lip service and a little bit of a golf clap to him. Yeah. We come into his presence. Holy, 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 yes. holy Lord. Yes. Amen? So in what way do you apply your faith to him? How does your perspective change when you read the scriptures, when you pray, or when you tithe and when you give money and time and resources? Are you sacrificing to him or are you sowing into who he is? Friends, God is no man's debtor. You will never outgive him. You will never. As soon as you think you're giving to the church or you're giving to people, you will always walk away disappointed. But when you have that perspective of placing your faith in him, that you are giving towards Jesus, when you're honoring him, that he is, he is worthy of it all, friends, you'll never walk away hurt because you know who you're doing it for and whose you are doing it in. Amen? So faith is ensuring that you see everything from Jesus' perspective. This rich young ruler came to him and he said, what do I do? Well, hold on a minute. If he had true identity, he would never ask that question. Because I just spent the first 15 minutes of this preach talking about the fact that what I do doesn't determine who I am. And that rich young ruler came to him and said, what do I do? Oh, Jesus answered him with where he was at. He was saying, which rules must I, keep? must I keep? What must I do to inherit eternal life? That's a very big question. Hello? It's a bit like if I get pulled over by a police officer and I said, what do I do to avoid this? <laughs> Hello? Which rules, Mr. Policeman, do I keep to avoid this penalty? Well, guess what? All of them. But you see, sin in our heart and sin in our life, of which Jesus has already dealt with, changes the question that we ask and we say, Jesus, how do I get away with what I've done? Well, It's the wrong question. Really, and I love how Jesus addresses this young man, he addresses his identity. He answers the question, but he addresses his identity. The young man should have really asked, who am I to be? Who must I be? The rich man, he asked, he asked, <laughs> I'm going to, Check my notes. A rich, rich man, <laughs> he asked, he asked, uh, what must I do to be perfect? What must I do to be accepted? What must I do to be loved? How do I belong? Where is home? I'm struggling. These were the words that, that, that his heart's cry really was. He was saying, he was saying where, is, where is my compass? Because my life is incomplete. I've got everything. I've done everything that I can and I have everything that I need, but I still lack this thing. Where is my true north? Friends, he was actually asking about salvation. He was actually asking about what it is to be home. How many know that salvation is free, but discipleship costs us, us everything? How many know that you can't have some of Jesus, you need all of him? How many know that you can't give part of yourself to him? He requires all of you. So right in this encounter, this young rich ruler came to Jesus 
and who is allowing his heart to be unmasked. And Jesus addresses. He says, if you want to be perfect, well, that was not the question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And the rich young ruler heard this beautiful response. Well, listen, mate, if you want to be perfect, you need to address your heart. If you want to be perfect, you need to open up your heart and actually receive the correction that I'm about to bring. This is what Jesus is saying to the rich young ruler. He knew what was veiling this young man's heart. The place where he placed his faith was certainly not in God. It was in his possessions and resources and, you know, but like for us, forget that he was even rich, okay? Let's just lay that aside because for, for us in Australia, we're very rich as comparison to the rest of the world. And so for us, I ask us the question, I, I used to even ask myself the question continually, where do I place my faith? Where am I found? Am I found in Jesus? Is who I am found in you, Lord? Do I really allow my heart to be opened before him? Because he's always speaking into And we know Jesus' response, keep the law. And it's interesting that he listed all the Ten Commandments written in the book of Isaiah except one. Do you know what it was? I can hear you asking, Matthew, tell me which one it was. Tell me, Matthew, tell me. Jesus listed this one. Jesus did not list this one because he addressed it as he unmasked this young man's heart. He, he, he did not list, do not covet. Because Jesus actually spoke to the young man's heart in a different way. See, Jesus is just, is, is just so darn good at ministering to our heart. He is just that good. You know, he could have said, young man, you put all your faith in your riches, you sloven dog. You covet all the time. You want what you don't have and yet you realize you've already got it all. He didn't do that. He didn't do that at all. He said this, if you want to be perfect, this is how you deal with that covetous issue in your heart. He said, go sell all you have, give it to the poor. He didn't say give it to the church or give it to certain this person or that person. He says, just go give it to the poor. Because your heavenly perspective is going to shift. Continue to keep the law, but come follow me. Friends, this is Jesus' invitation all the time. He said, your identity is not in your riches. Your identity is only ever found in unmasking our heart and stepping in to him. I'm going to come back to this scripture at some stage in the future. But I just get a sense, and I'm just going to pause here for a minute, that I just get a sense that within the atmosphere of this moment, you know, during worship this morning, I smelt rain as we, was, as we, were, stepping into, as, as we were stepping into that prophetic song about let the fire come and, and let the rain come. And I started to smell rain in the atmosphere. And, Josh Schuyler and I have been talking about last night about signs and wonders and a sign is really something that makes you wonder, God, why did you do that? You know, well, God can do anything he likes. You know, if he wanted to turn this into an apple, it would, he just say, look at that apple, boom, it would become an apple, right? That's the power of God's word. So he can do whatever he wants. Hello? But I just want to pause in this message right now and I'll pick this up in another week. I'll pick up the rest of this story and you're going to want to hear it. But during, during this time right now, I just get this sense 
that the Holy Spirit is calling for us to allow him to unmask our heart. When Jesus cried out, it is finished, the veil that, uh, that the strongest people and horses the Bible describes could not tear away. For hundreds of years, each year, a new cloth was placed up over uh, the veil that would separate the presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant, and the rest of the rooms in the temple. And friends, this was like man's idea that God had to be separated from man. Friends, when Jesus cried, it is finished, the Bible describes that there was a great earthquake and that earthquake and that veil was ripped in two. It did, just didn't fall off its hinges because it got too heavy. It just didn't fall away because, you know, if there was an earthquake, quick, let's put that thing back up. It was torn in two from the top to the bottom. And the Bible describes that there was absolutely nothing and no one that had enough strength to be able to do that. You see, friends, that's the display of God's heart. He unmasked his own heart. He took that veil away and he allowed us to see his heart. And that heart was displayed in the gift of his son, Jesus. As Jesus hung naked upon the cross, unveiled for all the world to see, he dealt with every issue of sin. He brought healing for your mind, healing for your heart, and an openness and an answer to say, welcome home. Welcome home. So can we pray together? Can we just invite throughout this week the Holy Spirit to just unmask our heart that we would be open to him. Holy Spirit, right now, we invite you this week throughout our lives, Lord, as we go about our daily life and as we go about our business. Let us be on your business, Lord. Holy Spirit, right now, I just ask that you would, you, you would unmask our hearts. We thank you, Jesus, that as we accept you as our Lord and our Saviour, that we have received eternal life. But Lord, we're not after a ticket out of here. What we are after is to see you as you deserve to be seen. That our identity would be found in you, Lord that, Lord, we are actually who you say that we are, that we are loved, that we are accepted, that we are forgiven, that we are made whole, that we are healed, that we are set free, that we are powerful, that we are empowered by the goodness of your truth, Lord, in our life. Holy Spirit, right now, I just ask that you would heal our hearts, that we would no longer be orphaned anymore, but we would be accepted into your loving embrace, God. Jesus, I thank you that you've dealt with the issue of sin. And so right now, Lord, we just thank you that you silence the voice of the accuser that tries to manipulate relationships, that tries to manipulate our own thinking, Lord, to believe that we are something that we are not. Jesus, we only accept who you say that we are. And so in this sovereign moment, Lord, let your reign fall. Let your fire come, God. That, Lord, we step into this truth 
that we place our faith completely in you. And the Lord, our identity is found beautifully in who you are. Not what we've done and certainly not what's been done to us. Lord, I am who you say that I am. I thank you, Jesus, that we are all accepted. And so Holy Spirit, in this moment right now, just let your healing come on every single heart that would be unmasked and unveiled. Let your glory be shown, Lord. Let your kingdom come, Father. Because <laughs> you're just so incredibly good, Lord. You can really sense just a beautiful presence right here, right now, amen. Can anyone smell that rain? I can just smell rain in the atmosphere. Let's just pray for those dry areas of Australia right now as well. I just get a sense there's a sovereignty for rain. Lord, right now in those dry areas of Australia, Lord, where there's forecast extreme heat, where there is fire and the danger of fire, and the fires that are still currently burning, Lord. Lord, I call for the natural fires to cease in Jesus' name. You will burn out in Jesus' name, that there will be no more loss, there will be no more destruction. <coughs> Lord, right now in Jesus' name, I thank you that it is not your judgment, Lord, but Lord, it is an opportunity for the church to rise, for the saints to pray, and Lord, that we make our requests known and we say, Lord, let these fires cease and desist in Jesus' name and let your rain come. Let the waters and let the clouds form. I speak to those clouds to form now in Jesus' name. I speak to the atmosphere to shift now in Jesus' name. Right now, Lord, Right now, we step into that place as a church right now, that we step into that place of intercession and we command the clouds to form and we command the rain to come in Jesus' name. And Lord, we call that as the rain falls, let your presence come in Jesus' name and bring healing, restoration and blessing on this nation. In the name of Jesus. And we all said... Amen. Thanks. Amen. Guys. Amen. Thank you. And we thank Pastor Matt for that. Thank you so much.